This is our final session for the day. Uh, my name is Mike Duffy. I am a partner in the uh, Chicago office, and uh, my partner Tim Sarsfield and I are going to do uh, a presentation for you on some issues involving the National Labor Relations Board. Uh, even though we have uh, you know, the, the time constraints that we have, certainly we welcome any questions that you might have. Uh, if we can't answer them, we'll be honest enough to tell you that. Uh, for some of these things, there are no answers. Uh, and you will find that, uh, regrettably, as management labor attorneys, we have opinions and we don't mind sharing them. So those of you who may represent unions here for some strange reason, I'm sorry. I'm going to insult you. It's just the way it is. Uh, but at any rate, since we saved the best for last, let's, uh, let's get started. Uh, we're going to talk about, uh, as I say, a few issues involving the National Labor Relations Board. Uh, the first one is really, do you even have to pay attention to this stuff? You know, or is this all no longer the law? Well, why do I say that? Well, a couple of years ago, in a case called New Process Steel, 2010, the Supreme Court was faced with a problem, and this happens from time to time in federal agencies when people's terms of office tend to fall by the wayside, and they no longer become part of the agency that they've been appointed to, and there are vacancies. And this happens in every federal agency, happens in every state agency, too. Well, in this particular situation, normally the Labor Board has five people that make up the National Labor Relations Board. At this point in time, they were down to three, and this happens. Uh, the three were going to rapidly become two because the Senate hadn't gotten around to ratifying any of the appointments for the Labor Board at that point in time. They just do that from time to time. And so in anticipation of the fact that the board, which requires by law three members to constitute a quorum, the three designated or delegated their authority to the remaining two. And then the third person left, and that was the end of him. Uh, so now in 2008, the board only had two members, but continued to issue decisions just like they had five. Ultimately, the matter got to the U.S. Supreme Court. Supreme Court said, you can't do that. Five is five, and three is three, and two isn't three. And if you don't have three, you can't do business. What did that mean? Well, it meant that decisions that had been issued from January of 2009 to March of 2010 were unlawful because the two-member board had absolutely no business issuing decisions without a three-member quorum. Well, we told you that story to tell you the next story. 2012. Board Chairman Wilman Liebman's term expires in the summer of 2011. The board loses member Craig Becker when his recess appointment expires January the 3rd, 2012. So on January the 3rd, 2012, you have two people left on the labor board, just like it was in 2008. But President Obama decided on January the 4th of 2012 to appoint three new board members as recess appointments so that the board would have a five-member complement so they would be fully in business. The problem is, were these three people validly appointed or not? Were they valid recess appointments? Well, what difference does it make? makes a lot of difference. Uh, in 2012, the board issued a bunch of new regulations on how union election campaigns are to be run. They are decidedly pro-union in their orientation and decidedly anti-employer, and they were intended to be so. Those regulations, if they weren't issued by a valid quorum of the board, are unlawful and of no consequence. Also, the board has issued hundreds of decisions since January of 2012, in many cases overturning a lot of established precedent. We'll talk about some of that today. Uh, that they would have had no business doing if they didn't have a quorum of validly appointed members of the board. And some other more mundane things like whether or not the labor board can take you to court and get a temporary restraining order may be something they can't do because the statute says the full board has to approve those kinds of injunctions and if you don't have a full board you can't do that. So the injunction would be unlawful because the government would have no authority to seek the injunction in the first place. Notwithstanding all of this, it sets a pattern for whatever presidents can do in the future, but we don't really care what presidents can do anywhere else. We care about the National Labor Relations Board. <coughs> so who's right? Can the president do this or can't he do this? The Constitution says the president shall have the power to fill up all vacancies that may happen during, quote, the recess of the Senate by granting commissions which shall expire at the end of their next session. That's all it says. 
doesn't say when that happens, doesn't say what a recess is, it doesn't say when a recess occurs, it just says when we have one of these things and there's a vacancy, the president can appoint people to various positions, cabinet positions, court positions, Supreme Court, there was a Supreme Court uh, uh, nominee once that was, uh, was put in as a recess appointment once upon a time uh, for a very short period of time. Uh, and presidents do this from time to time. Uh, in recent years, President Clinton did it, President Bush did it, <coughs> President Obama's done it. So it's something that happens from time to time. Question revolves around what is a recess? As I said, the Constitution doesn't define it. The only thing that even marginally has anything to do with this uh, that's the board calling, uh, is that, <laughs> you get it, there is a provision in, the, in the Article 1 that says that neither House of Congress can recess uh, or adjourn, they don't use the word recess, for more than three days without the permission of the other one. And from time to time, when this issue of recess appointments has come up in the past, uh, in 1993, the Justice Department argued that a recess by that definition in the, uh, in the Constitution, said that, well, you had to have an adjournment for more than three days, and that would mean that if you had a, a, a hiatus in the Senate for more than three days, that's a recess, and the president could make appointments uh, on a recess. So if you had a four-day weekend, I suppose, the president could make recess appointments. Uh, and Congress, from time to time, has, under both Republican and Democratic presidents, uh, acted not to be in recess and not to adjourn for more than three days without the permission of the other, just to keep the president from making recess appointments. Uh, the Democrats did it. The Republicans have done it. Both sides do it. It's a very common thing. Well, in this particular case involving the Labor Board, who's right? Is the president right? He says yes for several reasons. Uh, in January of 2012, the Justice Department concluded that the Senate, who was currently engaged in what they called pro forma sessions, uh, were not valid sessions because what happened is somebody would show up, stand in front of the camera at C-SPAN, say hi, talk for 10 minutes, and leave, and nothing would happen. And the president said, come on, that's not a session. You're not doing anything. That's nonsense. Uh, that may be nonsense, but whether that's a session or not is another issue. Uh, and by agreement, these pro forma sessions, nothing would be done. No real business would be conducted. It was just an opportunity for either party to come in and say, we're in session even though we may not be doing anything. Uh, and it's happened for, as I say, for many, many years. Uh, President's critics say, well, wait a minute, Mr. President, and with all due respect, it's not up to you to decide when Congress is in session. It's up for Congress to decide when Congress is in session. And you might be right philosophically, but legally you're not. And there have been cases where, in fact, the current Senate Majority Leader has said that these pro forma sessions were, in fact, valid and were sufficient to halt presidential appointments. But that's when George Bush was president, not when Barack Obama was president. So, you know, not that constitutional law should turn on who's the president, but it does. Uh, and in this case, depends on what side of the fence you're on uh, as to who's right. Well, enter a case called Noel Canning versus National Labor Relations Board, January 2013. Uh, by the court's own description, a quote, garden variety, to use the words of the court, refusal to bargain case, which the court summarily dealt with in about three sentences, said, yep, lawyer's wrong, board's right, you lose. But we have one other issue here, whether or not the board should have issued this decision in the first place, because we had three recess appointees, so question, are these validly appointed people? And the court said, no, they're not. Sorry, Mr. President. Not only was Congress in session, we don't have to reach that issue because we are reading the Constitution the way we ought to read it, which is to read it. And we've read it to say that when the appointments happen during the recess, in quotes, it means something, and it doesn't mean a weekend vacation. It means the time between the end of one session of Congress and the start of the next session of Congress. And in the bad old days, in the 1780s and the early 1800s, when it took six months to get to Washington, that meant something, because you might have. Congress would be out of session in November and not go back into session until April. It would take you five months probably to get back to Washington. And so the president needed something to be able, the mechanism to appoint people to federal agencies before these senators and congressmen took six months to get back to Washington for the next session. But 
We don't have that problem now. Nonetheless, the court said a session is a session. It is starts at the beginning of Congress, it ends at the end of Congress, and the next one starts at the beginning of the next Congress. And if something happens between that window, between the end of the first session and the beginning of the second, that's, Mr. President, when you can make recess appointments. And the problem is, sir, you made the recess appointments on the first day of the next session of Congress. Sorry, you lose. What does that mean? They completely invalidated the power of the National Labor Relations Board to do business. What did the Labor Board do? Promptly ignored them. They said, we're still in business. You're wrong. We're the Labor Board. We don't care. We don't have to. Uh, it's essentially what they said. I'm not trying to be overly facetious here, even though I am. Uh, so if the Supreme Court, which is now going to hear this case, rules in favor of the appellate court's decision in Noel Canning, what happens? About 1,400 Labor Board decisions go right out the window. We are back to those thrilling days of December 31st, 2011. And anything that happened after that is unlawful, illegal, improper, and immoral. As I said, the board threw down the gauntlet and said, well, Noel Canning is wrong. We're not going to follow it. We're still in business. Go ahead. Hold us in contempt. We don't care. Uh, and in some respects, the board is probably right because the ruling is only in favor of that company, that employer, it doesn't, they didn't issue an injunction against the board operating, so the board is continuing to operate, as, as government agencies are wont to do. Uh, and as far as they're concerned, they're going to continue to operate, and they issue decisions every day, and they're going to continue to do that. Uh, what's happened since Noel Canning? Well, this isn't the only case that's out there. There are several other courts of appeals that are looking at this issue as we speak. We're waiting for a decision in the D.R. Horton case, which I believe is either in the 5th or the 11th Circuit, depending on which of those two is part of Texas. Uh, I always get that mixed up because it used to be the 5th and now one of them is the 11th. But one of those two is going to decide this case probably any day now, if not even today. Uh, the issue there is even more important because it has to do with the legality of class action waivers in severance agreements with employees or arbitration agreements with employees. And a lot of times uh, you will say in those agreements that the employee can only litigate for themselves, not on behalf of a class. And the Labor Board says that's illegal, you can't do that. And every court of appeals that's looked at that issue said that's crazy. Of course they can do that. You're wrong. Uh, but that issue, as I said, is before the Court of Appeals, but they've also raised the Noel Canning issue. So that ought to be entertaining to see what they do. But another case that we didn't know was out there that came down just a couple of days ago, uh, New Vista Nursing in the Third Circuit said, yeah, we read Noel Canning, they're right. Yep, sorry, board, you lose. That's two courts of appeals that have said that you're out of business. I suppose when we get to the ninth and the tenth, we'll probably have a board that'll finally say, yeah, I guess we're out of business. Uh, there's, there's, who knows? There's other cases that are also floating around that have some bearing on related issues. Uh, the board's rule on streamlining union elections was invalidated by the district court right after Noel Canning came down. Uh, the board appealed that case to the D.C. Circuit. The D.C. Circuit said, what are you doing here? You don't exist. Get out of here. They wouldn't even hear the appeal. So I don't know what they're going to do about that. Uh, it's kind of entertaining to watch courts and the board fight with each other. There was a case, oh, Lord, that was probably two years out of law school, where the labor board had rendered a decision and it was contrary to a line of cases in the Third Circuit. In fact, the case was Allegheny Ludlam, if I remember correctly. And the board said, well, with all due respect to the appellate court, we think the law is this. And the Court of Appeals, following the board's decision, said, we don't care if you respectfully disagree with us or not. We're the court, you're the board, we win, you lose. And so there's always this tension between the courts and the administrative agencies, and this is no exception. Uh, and there was another case that came down just a few weeks ago, which is of some interest. It doesn't really have anything to do with what we're talking about, but it's something you should be aware of because there was a rule the board had promulgated, and, and it may be illegal based on the, the makeup of the board, but the, board, the court didn't even bother to get to that issue. They said, we don't care, even if it was a valid complement of the board people. The rule was requiring all employers to post government-sponsored notices telling everybody why it was great to join unions for two and three pages. And if you've ever seen those notices, you were supposed to have posted those uh, a few months ago. Well, the court entered an injunction and said, nah, not so fast. We want to take a look at this. Uh, a couple of days ago, the D.C. Circuit, again, the best friend of the Labor Board these days, said not only is this rule dumb, 
but it's illegal. You can't do this. This is a violation of the First Amendment. You cannot make employers tell their employees anything. You don't have that power. The Constitution didn't give that to you, so, you know, here again, the document uh, that's been annoying government officials since 1789 strikes again. You cannot tell an employer what kind of speech they have to engage in. There's also a part of the Labor Act that says that, too, which they always ignore, but this time they can't ignore the Constitution. So they totally invalidated that rule. Uh, obviously, in all these cases, Supreme Court review is expected and likely. So what should you do about all of this? Well, if you've lost the Labor Board case since January of 2012 and you want to appeal that, the D.C. Circuit would be a great place to appeal that. <laughs> that would be my first relatively cheap legal advice. Uh, I would stay, or the Third Circuit would be good, too, if you could get there. But you can always get to the D.C. Circuit. So good place to argue. It's a very nice courtroom, a couple of good restaurants a few blocks away, and, and it's, it's a very nice place. Um, if you are involved in board litigation at the administrative level, as uh, Brother Sarsfield and I are currently going to be involved in, uh, you will raise and preserve this issue. The first argument to the administrative law judge should be, you don't have the power to hear this case, Your Honor. Uh, now let's get to the merits. Uh, <laughs> preserve the issue, obviously. And at the labor board, preserving the issue is very important because historically in litigation with the labor board, if you don't do that, they take advantage of the fact that you neglected to preserve an issue and they jump all over it, even if it's an issue that they have no business hearing. They'll say, well, you still didn't raise it. Well, it didn't matter. You couldn't hear it. doesn't matter. You didn't raise it. And, and the courts of appeals go along with that. Uh, I could give you long-winded examples of that, but just suffice it to say, raise the issue. Preserve it. Raise it at every single opportunity. You don't have the power to hear this case. You know Why? Noel Canning. That's all you need to know. That's a winning argument in the D.C. Circuit. Uh, another issue which we found a couple weeks ago, in fact, uh, yeah, it's a couple weeks ago, we believed, still believe, that the board's ability to get 10J injunction relief, interim injunction relief, uh, is a problem because it requires a legal board to grant that authority. Uh, a district court in New Mexico uh, recently decided in a 10J case that the board could get an injunction because in 2001, during one of the last times they had these vacancies that came up, they delegated the power to seek 10-J relief to the NLRB's general counsel and supposedly, according to the district court, they never revoked that authorization. I, I think that's a crock, but what I think doesn't matter. I'm not the District of New Mexico Circuit Court. But there is some issue out there with whether respect that the Labor Board actually still has the authority to get 10-J interim injunction relief or whether the General Counsel can do this on their own. Uh, it's an interesting legal argument. Uh, hopefully I'll never have to confront that issue, but if we do, uh, it's something that you should be aware of. And one final thing is that the whole administrative structure of the board, the unfair labor practice charges, the investigations, the administrative hearings at the administrative law judge level can still go forward. The law doesn't say they can't function, it's just that the process stops once you finish that because if Noel Canning is correct, the board the, the full board in Washington doesn't exist and can't hear appeals and render final decisions on what are necessarily interim uh, uh, administrative orders. So stay tuned. Uh, sometime about this time next year, the Supreme Court might very well address this issue and tell us what the answer is. Uh, we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about some uh, cases which I think are uh, very important bearing uh, to employers these days uh, based on this uh, unlawful labor board that's issued these decisions in the last year or so. Uh, so unless the Supreme Court says that the labor board has to listen, the labor board says that these cases are still good law, so you should be aware of them. Well, the first one I'm going to talk about, and then I'm going to hand the, uh, the uh, program over to Tim Sarsfield, uh, it's a case called American Baptist Homes, or otherwise known as Piedmont Gardens. Uh, Labor Board always refers to cases by little shorthand, and they call this case Piedmont Gardens. Why? Because they do. Uh, Piedmont Gardens, continuing care facility in Oakland, California, uh, basically independent living and nursing services, what we used to call in the less enlightened days a nursing home. All right. So Piedmont Gardens is running this uh, uh, senior care facility in Oakland. And in June of 2011, the head nurse uh, notified the HR director that, gee, guess what? We caught somebody sleeping on the job. 
Garden variety sleeping on the job case happens all the time. It happens every day. Uh, and people sometimes get caught and they get fired for it routinely. So what happened? Well, the HR director did what any lawyer would tell the HR director to do. Write it down. Give me a written statement so I've got something for the file. And then told her, give me the statement. We'll keep it confidential because, unfortunately, there's a union involved here. This is usually what happens in these cases. There's a union involved. Well, there was here, too. So she does that. She writes up her incident report. She gives it to the human resources director. And a second head nurse also saw this gentleman sleeping on the job. This must have been a popular thing that day because there were several people that saw him sleeping on the job. She heard that the head nurse had turned in a uh, report. She did the same thing on her own, slipped it under the HR director's door and said, nope, I saw this too, slid it under the door and handed it to him. The HR director then did an investigation, as good HR directors should do, and asked a, uh, a CNA, a certified nursing attendant, we used to call them orderlies when I was one, uh, to prepare a statement documenting this person's witnessing of this gentleman sleeping on the job. So we had three people see this guy sleep on the job. Why did they need three pieces of evidence? Because they knew they were going to go to arbitration and they needed all the testimony they could get because arbitrators don't like to fire people. So they needed lots of evidence. And of course, after reviewing the witness statements, they have the story locked in. The company terminated this gentleman's employment for sleeping on the job. So what does the union do? Well, during the course of the investigation of the grievance which was filed protesting his discharge, the union made a request for information, among which the union asked for copies of all witness statements, including the one that the HR director told the head nurse, this is confidential, no one will ever see this. Well, you know, we lied. Uh, the union wants to see it. They want a copy of it. They want to know what you said and who said it and when. Well, for those of you who deal with unions, frequently, as we do, uh, information requests are things unions do all the time. They, they annoy uh, the daylights out of employers because they ask for all sorts of things which you probably don't want to give them. But historically, when unions ask for witness statements in this context, the National Labor Relations Board case law said you didn't have to give it to them. Why? Because you didn't. We decided that it was important for employers to conduct investigations. It was important to give confidentiality assurances to witnesses who saw these things so they would be candid, tell the truth, and therefore to keep the witnesses from being harassed by the union that the employer did not have to give those statements over to the union, especially if these were statements made by fellow bargaining unit employees because it's bad enough that supervisors are doing this. That's fine. They're kind of hard to harass the supervisor, although it's possible, but it's very easy to harass a coworker and sort of convince them that they probably didn't see what they thought they saw and they should repudiate their statement or else. And that happens with some frequency, unfortunately. So the company said, no, nope, we've checked with our labor attorney. We read, read a case called Anheuser-Busch, which coincidentally came out of this city for reasons I don't understand, but it did. And Anheuser-Busch in 1978 said, you don't have to give witness statements to a union if you're an employer. You just don't. We're not going to. Talk to your lawyer. We talk to ours. We know we're right. You're wrong. So what did the union do? Well, of course, they go to the National Labor Relations Board, which doesn't like employers very much these days, and they filed an unfair labor practice charge saying the employer violated the act by not giving relevant information to the union. And the labor board, surprisingly, overruled Anheuser-Busch and said, you know, that may have been the law in 1978, but, you know, this is 2011, and we don't think that's the law anymore, and we overrule that case. So what is the law? Well, the law up until Piedmont Gardens, apart from witness statements, was if the information the union wants is relevant, you have to give it to them. But you don't always have to give it to them in the way they ask for it. You simply have to give them the information. So you could tell them what the facts are. You just don't have to tell them who told you what the facts are. That would be, in some cases, sufficient information for the union to prepare its case in arbitration. And if the employer says, well, this stuff is confidential, we don't want to give it to you, the, there's been all sorts of cases, in fact, some of them went to the Supreme Court, over whether or not you could balance the employer's need for confidentiality as opposed to the union's desire to get the information. And it was a case, I believe, Detroit Edison, where they, the union wanted copies of, of tests for promotions, 
and the employer said, we're not going to give you the copies of the tests so you can give the questions to the people who are going to take them before they take the test. That kind of defeats the purpose. And the labor board, oh, no, you have to give them the test. And the Supreme Court said, what, are you crazy? They don't have to do that. And so, you know, the labor board spanked again. Uh, but that whole tension of how much you have to give them versus how much confidentiality you as the employer can maintain has been a constant battle for many, many years with one bright spot that as far as witness statements were concerned, you didn't have to give those. Well, what'd they do? Labor board said, eh, we don't like Anheuser-Busch anymore. We overruled it. And they're saying now that there's no real difference, which there is, but they say there isn't, between witness statements and any other kind of information that an employer has. And therefore, we're going to apply the normal rules, which is you have to discuss with the union how you give them the information and still maintain the confidentiality that you want to maintain. I submit to you that's a test you will never pass under the Labor Board's analysis. I know, because I've had these arguments with the Labor Board since then, and their position is give them the information. But they're confidential. We want to work something out. Give them the information or we're going to issue a complaint. That's how much confidentiality the Labor Board recognizes these days. So not to be too cynical, what the Labor Board essentially has done, in my opinion, has, to, has said if you're going to take a witness statement from somebody and the union asks for it in the context of an arbitration proceeding, a grievance proceeding, you have to give it to them because that's what the Labor Board will tell you ultimately. That may be well and good for an arbitration and a grievance because eventually everybody's going to know the facts anyway, but what about a sex harassment investigation? Let's shift gears a tiny bit. Sex harassment investigation is a tiny bit different, different set of laws, but somebody might get fired as a result of a sex harassment investigation, and frequently they do. In the process of that, any lawyer will tell you you need to get witness statements to make sure that you've fleshed out your entire investigation so if you're going to fire somebody, you've got good basis for it because you know you're probably going to be in litigation. And if the person that's going to get fired may be a union represented employee, the union is going to want to get copies of these witness statements that you've taken that the EEOC has told you you must assure are confidential and not disclosed. So which statute do you follow? Depends what forum you're in, doesn't it? The EEOC will tell you, don't let these things out. They're confidential, and that's what we would normally do. On the other hand, the National Labor Relations Board will tell you, don't listen to the EEOC. Do what we tell you to do and release the witness statements. What would I do? I don't know. I haven't had that position yet. But I would probably tell the Labor Board to go ahead and issue a complaint. We'll see him sometime down the road. Uh, but... I just point that out to you because there's not necessarily consistency in how these various agencies enforce their laws, and in many times they are contradictory. happens frequently. Uh, Tim and I have a case where the U.S. Department of Labor has a regulation which we followed and we terminated somebody, and the Labor Board is saying, well, you can't do that. We're saying, yeah, the regulation says we have to. And, well, I don't care. You know, That's the Department of Labor. We're the Department of Labor. Well, wait a minute. Different part of the Department of Labor. So, ah, never mind, we're the Labor Board, and we're saying you can't do that. So it should be entertaining when we get to the Supreme Court. Uh, okay. Uh, we will now move to Tim's portion of the program. Let me ask you a question. Please. Yes. If you have a company who does not, if the lawyers who are representing Piedmont Gardens do mm -hmm. not give these statements, yes. what, can, what, what happens? What can happen next? Question, question is, if, if Piedmont Gardens is asked to give the statements and they don't do it, right. they say, we're not going to do it, then what happens? Well, that's exactly what happened in that case. They told the union, no, we're not doing it. They went to the labor board. The labor board issued a complaint. They went through administrative hearing process and ultimately, a couple of years later, wound up in front of the labor board. What the labor board could conceivably do is to say that you violated the union's rights for information, they were not able to prepare their case properly in arbitration, so if the employee loses, we may ask you to reinstate them and pay them back pay after three or four years. Is that possible? Yes, it's very possible. Was the Labor Board have a valid form at that time? Uh, I believe they did. I believe they did. Uh, although there's uh, one of them, there's a question as to the status of one of them. But yeah, and that issue uh, hasn't yet been determined in the courts of appeals. But it's 
it's a, it's a, your, your initial reaction is tell the labor board, you know, forget it. We're not doing it. Go ahead. They could go to federal court and try to get an injunction and speed up the process, and they might do that in the right case. Uh, they don't do that a lot, but they can if they want to. And if they think it's one of these precedent-setting cases that they want to establish some new you know, doctrine in the law, they might go into federal court and try to get an injunction a lot earlier than waiting for the administrative process, to, which takes a couple, three years to, to you know, pan itself out. This can be fairly quick. I mean, you can get in front of a federal judge in a couple of weeks if you get the right one. Yeah, but they want a great risk right now that that federal judge might say. It might say, sorry, Charlie, you're not in business. Right. No, but, they, but they found one in New Mexico who said, yeah, there you are. So, okay. you know, who knows? It's luck of the draw sometimes. I know one thing. They won't be asking for 10-J injunctions in the District of Columbia Federal <laughs> District Court. Or probably, or probably in, uh, anywhere in Pennsylvania either. So, But stay tuned. <laughs> Tim, yeah. all yours. And along those lines, if the uh, Supreme Court decides that they have a quorum or eventually uh, President Obama is able to get his current package uh, confirmed by the Senate, they're going to adopt this case. And what happens then is they'll issue an order. You can say, go get it enforced. If the federal court enforces it and you still tell the federal court, I'm not going to hand it over, then you're facing contempt citations. So that's, that's how it, it might all play out. And I, Mike may have mentioned this, <clears throat> and I'll just repeat it is, you know, eventually we are going to end up with a board. And, and you know, if it's a, if it's a board, you know, in the next year or so that's been appointed by the president, these cases, maybe they're not good right now, but they will be adopted by the new board, no matter what its compensa uh, composition is. Maybe three to two, maybe two to one, uh, but these will be the law probably within the next year or so, one way or the other, in my opinion. <clears throat> uh, my name is Tim Sarsfield. I'm an attorney here in St. Louis. I work in the labor and uh, employment uh, department. Um, Missouri and Illinois are employment at will states, but we are not right to work states. And the reason that I mention that is because in the last month or so, I've had about three or four different conversations where people confuse those concepts. Employment at will simply means you can fire somebody for good reason, bad reason, no reason whatsoever. You just can't fire them for any legal reason. Whether you're right to work or not right to work, <coughs> Uh, will determine whether you can have union security clauses or not. And as I mentioned, Illinois and Missouri are not right-to-work states. So what does that mean? It means you can have union security here <coughs> in, in Missouri. What is union security? Well, that's where <coughs> a union and employer negotiate a provision in the contract that says after 30 days you have to join the union and you have to pay your dues or the company has to fire you. So it's like a tax. It's something that you have to pay. It's a condition of employment. Usually, not always, but usually uh, if you have union security, you have a dues checkoff clause. And that's where the employer just withholds the money and sends it in <clears throat> on your behalf. You could also have dues checkoff clauses <clears throat> in right-to-work states um, as well. Now, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> what happens when a contract expires? Well, for years, the board has said certain provisions in the contract die with the contract. So you don't have to go to arbitration when the contract has the arbitration clause dies or expires. Uh, your no lockout, your no strike clause dies with the contract. Union security dies with the contract. There are certain other provisions that you have to maintain the status quo either until the union agrees you can make the change or you reach what we call impasse. The parties are just at loggerheads as to what you should do, but then the employer can implement its last, best, and final offer. Some of it, all of it, none of it. <clears throat> so what about dues checkoff? Well, for 50 years, since 1962, the board has said dues checkoff is one of those things that dives with the contract. Um, and that, that gives the, an employer certain advantages that I'll talk about in a minute. But <clears throat> last year, in WKYC TV Inc., the board said, we're going to throw out this 50 years worth of precedent um, and we're going to change the law. From now on, you have to maintain <laughs> uh, dues checkoff even after the contract expires, either until you get a new agreement and the union agrees that dues checkoff should be taken out, and that's almost impossible to get a union to agree to, or you bargain to impasse and then you can implement your last, best, and final offer. Um, 
And although they had rejected this theory or, or this rationale that's up on the screen right now for 50 years, they decided, no, what we think is union security, or excuse me, uh, dues checkoff, it's a little bit more like a pension, or it's a little bit more like medical, it's a little bit more like wages, subcontracting. It doesn't just die with the contract, it's just a term and condition of employment, and it needs to remain in effect uh, until, <clears throat> until, like I said, either the union agrees that you can, you can cut it off, or you can unilaterally implement. So how does that impact employers? Well, a lot of times when you get to the end of a contract, you just negotiate a new contract, but sometimes you can't. And then what will happen is sometimes you get labor strife, you get a strike or you get a lockout. But occasionally, or quite often, the union will work without a contract. And why that's dangerous for the employer is that allows the union to build up its war chest and to decide when it's going to strike. They will pick a time when it's most damaging to you, obviously. So what's an employer to do to bring some pressure to bear on the union? Well, one thing that employers would do, and this was interesting, you didn't have to talk about dues checkoff during the negotiation. You didn't have to make any proposals on dues checkoff. You could continue dues checkoff even while they were working without a contract, but at a time and place of your choosing, you could bring some pressure to the union. You could say, look, we're cutting off dues checkoff. You're not going to, you go collect the money from your members. And if you look at it, most unions get about 90% of their income from dues. And there's a fair number of dues paying members that are only paying because you're taking it out of their check. And so it was a way to get the union to say, okay, okay, we'll sign your last proposal, let's get a contract, let's get this over and done with. So it does take away one weapon from employers in that context. Alan Ritchie, Inc. <clears throat> now this is an interesting case. It doesn't really change the law that much, but now it's a, a method that the, the union can make uh, an employer want to get to a contract. <clears throat> you have a non-union firm. You have rules that govern your employees. Uh, a union tries to organize your employees. They win the election. Now you sit down and you bargain a contract. So what goes on while you're bargaining the contract? I mean, you're still going to have disciplinary issues. You know, you're going to catch people sleeping on the job. You're going to have people sexually harass people. You're going to have people late for work. You're going to have people do poor performance. Well, in Alan Ritchie, <coughs> this company, had a handbook and it had absenteeism standards and it had all sorts of different rules and regulations and like a lot of handbooks it said if you're caught sleeping on the job the penalty can include anything up to and including discharge or if you have poor performance you can receive any discipline up to and including uh, discharge. They didn't have real defined criteria for what poor performance meant. I mean, it was kind of like the supervisor could look at a performance one night and say, look, you're having a bad night. I'm not going to do anything here. But after three or four bad nights, he might decide to give you a written warning. <clears throat> what the board decided in Alan Ritchie was <clears throat> that, look, those rules have discretion built into them. For example, it's not that if you only build 10 widgets, you're going to get a written warning. It's if you have poor performance, you're going to get a written warning. So before you discipline somebody for poor performance, you have to sit down and bargain with the union over it. Your policy says, well, if you get caught sleeping on the job, your discipline can be up to discharge. Well, you've got to sit down and you've got to bargain with the union before you do anything. Now, that doesn't sound like a real big issue until you've dealt with a union that knows how to drag out this disciplinary procedure forever and a day. What they will say is, okay, you want to write this guy up for poor performance? Give us everybody's performance records for the last 18 months. And now we're going to sit down <clears throat> with a thousand employees and we're going to decide, well, how come this guy didn't get written up here a year ago? You know, what, what was it about tonight that, that justified a written warning as opposed to this guy from a year ago or from six months ago? <clears throat> Now, one bad thing for Alan Ritchie was it took 13 years before the board decided this case. And in the meantime, they were firing people, and they were disciplining people, and they were doing all sorts of things, and now they may be on the hook to rectify all of those. They may be bringing people back with back pay that they fired 
what, during Bush's first term um, or, or the end of Clinton's uh, term. Now, <coughs> the, uh, the board did build somewhat of a, a little bit of a loophole into this for employers for exigent circumstances. What that really means is, you know, if a guy comes to work with a gun and actually takes a shot at somebody, you can probably suspend him before you have to bargain with the union. You'll probably have to bargain with them before you turn it into a discharge. But, you know, you can do at least some discipline in situations like that. But it's going to be very, very limited situations. You're going to really need to have something spectacularly bad and some really solid evidence that the guy's guilty in order to suspend. And I do think you're going to have to bargain over, over whether the, a discharge is going to occur or, or not. Now, <clears throat> Lesser forms of discipline, like oral warnings and written warnings, you don't have to bargain before you discipline there, but you do for suspensions and, and, uh, and, and, dis and discharges, um, <clears throat> unless the written warning or the oral warning will trigger some greater. And, and what they're getting about there is I was just looking at a set of rules today where a client has a whole bunch of rules where you can end up with oral, written, suspension, or discharge. You know, it's a four-step process, but they have all these different tracks for rule, rules violations. But they say, well, if you get six rules violations of any kind in a year, then you're discharged. And so you might only be getting a oral warning, but it might be your sixth one. So you're going to have to sit down and bargain with the union before you orally uh, warn the guy in that, in that context. Now we'll talk about union organizing, the good, the bad, and the ugly. <clears throat> And we'll start off with the good, as embodied by Mr. Eastwood. Um, and we'll start talking about right to work. Um, in the late 40s, the NLRB gave the states the right to ban uh, union security clauses if they wanted to. And from the late 40s until the mid-60s, a number of states jumped into the mix. And after about 1965, about once every 12 or 15 years, another state would uh, ban union security uh, clauses, and it was usually uh, in, in southern states. For example, Texas went to right to work in 1992. Oklahoma went uh, right to work in 2002. Uh, here recently, there's been more activity here and in some surprising states. Uh, in 2011, Indiana passed right to work legislation. Uh, that they were really the first Rust Belt state to do so. That uh, legislation is being challenged in the courts, but so far it's doing pretty well. Some of the challenges are under federal law. Those are failing pretty easily. Some of the challenges deal with intricacies of Indiana state law, about whether it was read enough times in the legislature, et cetera, et cetera. But so far it looks like Indiana's uh, legislation is going to be upheld. <clears throat> to everyone's shock, uh, early this year, Michigan went right to work. Um, and again, there are a number of challenges, but so far that legislation is, is, passing, is passing muster. <coughs> Missouri was considering right to work legislation. Uh, in fact, there was a bill introduced in the legislature. It did not get out of committee. Uh, I listened to a lobbyist speak yesterday, and what he said was, here's what happened there. I think you need 109 or 110 votes to override uh, a veto by Governor Nixon. Uh, and the Republicans have, a, and he would veto the right to work legislation. The Republicans have the 110 votes, maybe a few more. But what he said is, <clears throat> we've always got about six to eight Republicans who feel like they either can or must play ball with the unions, and we lose them on the veto override vote. So what it sounds like is <clears throat> that right to work legislation is dead in Missouri unless Republicans pick up more seats in 2014 or they win the governorship in 2016. But other states around the country are considering right to work legislation. I saw that Ohio's considering it now, New Hampshire's considering it. A number of different states are considering right to work legislation. If you're interested, <laughs> Missouri is non right to work, Illinois is non right to work. Kentucky, which has a little sliver to border on Missouri, much to my surprise, is not right to work. All the other surrounding states are right to work. What does right to work mean? 
doesn't mean it's illegal to organize a union. It doesn't actually make it harder to organize a union. In fact, in some respects, it makes it a little easier to organize a union because in a, <clears throat> in a non-right to work state, what you campaign on is, look, the one thing you can absolutely positively be guaranteed of if the union gets in here is you're going to have to pay union dues. You may not like what the union's doing. You may think the union's doing a crappy job, but you're going to have to pay union dues. In a right to work state, or in a non-right to work state, the unions can campaign on, look, give us a shot. If you don't like us, you don't have to pay us. Um, which does lead, though, to why unions don't like it so much. It gives them less incentive to organize. The unions freely admit they have a huge problem with getting people to pay dues. People very often are very dissatisfied with their product and just don't want to pay dues in non-right to work states. Union representation continues to trend down. <clears throat> As you can see, in 1977, a little over 23% of all employees in the private sector belonged to unions. In 2012, it's 7.3. Now, the union penetration rate, it varies from sector to sector. For example, in manufacturing, it's 10.5. Construction is one of the most heavily unionized industries still in America. It's a little over 13. It's almost 14%. I would note that if you've seen these numbers, you might see different versions of these numbers. For example, in the papers, a lot of times they'll talk about the overall rate being closer to 12, but that's a blended rate of state, local, federal, and private sector employees. With private sectors, it's the 7.3, the number that I used, <coughs> includes people who are covered by union contracts but haven't joined a union. If you only look at people who belong to unions, that number's closer to six. Uh, now, we get to the bad. <clears throat> this is uh, one of my favorite character actors, Lee Van Cleef. I always thought he played such a wonderful uh, bad guy. One of the things that's going on here is the NLRB is making a conscientious effort to reach out to non-unionized employers, to reach out to employees who normally would not think about belonging to a union. You go to the union's website, you can very, very quickly find a link because they have a picture of all these smiley, happy people that says concerted activity. And if you click on the link, what you will see is <clears throat> what I have up there where they tell you, look, this law protects you even if you aren't in a union. So if two or more of you band together and want to complain to your boss, your boss can't uh, uh, punish you for doing, for doing so. It's almost like you can form a union without having. A, a union. And below that description, they have a map of the United States that you can click on different cases and they'll give you a description of a case. And I thought a few of these were sort of interesting. You know, one came out of Texas. Now, that's not a hotbed of unionization. And it involved the professional trade association. What this trade association did was it, it provided services to dentists. And again, that's not what you would think of as being a group that would have a whole lot of pro-union people. But what happened was a number of employees <coughs> wrote a, put together a petition protesting some stuff that upper management did. And they didn't actually sign their names. They used uh, things like Mandrake the Magician and Mickey Mouse and different, different things like that. But one of the supervisors knew exactly who had signed it. So they called her in and said, who signed this? And she said, well, I'm not going to tell you. I think they have a right to circulate a petition. And if they want to be anonymous, they can be anonymous. And they said, you don't tell us you're fired. And she said, I'm not going to tell you. So they fired her. And she ended up down at the board. And she filed a charge and ended up <clears throat> with a settlement worth about $900,000. And I picked this for a couple of reasons. Number one is, <clears throat> as a general matter, supervisors are not covered by the National Labor Relations Act. One area where they are covered is you cannot fire a supervisor for refusing to violate the law. Uh, so that's one thing. The second thing is a lot of times people think, well, you know, board stuff, there's hardly any penalties involved. But obviously it costs uh, the employer a great deal to buy out this supervisor and another, uh, you know, another employee. Another case came out of uh, the state of Washington. Now here it dealt with somebody that you might think is being more unionized, a construction contractor. 
five employees did a YouTube video and they criticized the employer and they got fired. I think as you know from Tabitha's presentation this morning, the board is obsessed with, with the concept that employees must be allowed to publicly criticize you. So a couple of things here. Anytime you're thinking about firing an employee because of something they did on social media, you really need to think National Labor Relations Act, and especially if two or more employees are involved. Because um, the board is all over these, <coughs> these cases. This, this morning I was just reading about another case where an ALJ found that some employees that had criticized their employer on Facebook were unlawfully discharged. So it's, it's a very hot topic uh, right, right now. And, and I think as Tabitha may have pointed out to you, you know, you, you can't defend one of these like you defend most discrimination cases where you go, I don't care whether the guy was white or black. We would have fired him either way. I don't care if the guy was over 40, under 40. It's not that kind of thing. The very act of complaining is what is protected. This next case came out of Missouri, and here an employee was talking about what kind of a raise she got or what her wages were with some co-employees, and the employer had a policy that said you're not supposed to talk about your wages amongst yourself and fired the person. Um, this is not a very surprising decision. That, is, that has been the board's position since at least Eisenhower was president maybe since 1935, but I know that there's cases going back to the mid-50s. Um, and so I only did this uh, to, to, to warn employees, if you, employers, if you've got a policy like this, you need to take it down. And I really didn't think many employers would, except yesterday I got a call from an employer that said, hey, I just fired a guy because he was talking about his pay raises to uh, some of the other people. And we have this policy so that says you can't talk about pay raises, and now I've got all this material from the board. What do I need to do? It's like what we <laughs> need to do is settle real quick with this guy, and we need to get rid of that, uh, particular, uh, that particular policy. Uh, then this next one came out of, out, of, out of Florida, and this was a case that I think Mike may have referred to. A uh, supervisor thought he was misclassified. He got some other people that he thought had been misclassified. They wanted to pursue a collective action under the Fair Labor Standards uh, Act. The employer had an arbitration provision, and the, and the employer said, so A, you have to go to arbitration, and B, no, no, no collective actions. These arbitration decisions need to be decided one at a time. And the board said, well, that's, that's illegal. That's, pre that's preventing employers from banding together uh, and pursuing an action collectively. Uh, this is now up on appeal before the Fifth Circuit, and they're one of the courts that's deciding whether there's even a quorum uh, or not. I would note that the Eighth Circuit decided a case where a company had an arbitration provision. They just decided it late last year, the early part of this year, where the company had an arbitration provision. It said no collective actions, no class actions. You gotta go to arbitration, but you gotta pursue your, your case individually. And the, and the Eighth Circuit said that that provision was fine, that it's, it's not illegal. The plaintiffs in that case cited this Horton case. It wasn't coming out of the board, and they said, hey, the board said differently. The Eighth Circuit said, we don't care what the board had to say, because this is a matter of interpreting the Federal Arbitration Act, and the board has no expertise when it comes to interpreting the FAA. They may with respect to the NLRA, but they have no expertise when it comes to the FAA, so we just think they're wrong. Now, <clears throat> to pick up on something that Mike talked about, that doesn't mean that if you have arbitration policies that prohibit class actions or uh, collective actions that you can just say, hey, I'm in Missouri, I'm in the Eighth Circuit, I don't have to care about what the board means, because at my first job, what we used to always say was the board had to respectfully go to hell policy with respect to courts of appeals decisions. The regional director here in St. Louis won't care about that Eighth Circuit case. We can cite it to him, but he's going to say, all I care about is what the board said. The ALJ is not going to care what the Eighth Circuit had to say, he's only going to care about what the board had to say. Chances are the board isn't going to care what the Eighth Circuit had to say, they're only going to care about what they have to say. Now eventually you can get that case up before the Eighth Circuit, 
and the Eighth Circuit's going to care what the Eighth Circuit has had to, had to say on the, on the subject. They're going to care deeply, and they won't enforce it. But the problem that you've got there is that might be five years down the road, and that can cost you a lot of, a lot of money. So you sort of have to balance out, you know, the, 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 it's cost-benefit analysis. Is it really worth fighting this, or do I just sort of want to go along, at least until this gets straightened out? Because I do think <clears throat> that this is one of those, those cases that's going to end up in the Supreme Court. I mean, even if the Fifth Circuit says you've got a quorum, whether they agree with the board or don't agree with the board, I think the, the Supreme Court's going to end up picking this case up at some point in time. Another thing that employer or that the board is doing is they are scrutinizing employer handbooks. I can guarantee you that if your name pops up down at the National Labor Relations Board, at some point in time, they're either going to ask the employee for a copy of the handbook, they're certainly going to ask you, and they're going to go through it with a fine-tooth comb to try to find violations of the act. And some of the things that they've been looking at are at-will disclaimers, confidentiality, social media, off-duty employee access, the arbitration, which I've talked about, media and government contracts, and they're finding all sorts of things that you would think are relatively logical to be unlawful. For example, uh, late last year, they found this particular clause to be unlawful. I further agree that the at-will employment relationship cannot be amended, modified, or altered in any way. Now, the problem wasn't that you said that they were at will. The problem there was, I agree, it cannot be amended, modified, or altered in any way. They said that will make an employee think it's futile to join a union because the union can't get a just cause provision. Now, that's nuts. I don't think any employee would read it that way, but they said it did. Now, what you can do, say you're an at-will employee and you, the only person in the company that can alter your status is the president of the company in writing. But anytime you try to make it sound like there's nothing the employee can possibly do to alter his status, then it's a little bit problematic. This particular <coughs> policy, this non-disparagement policy, was found unlawful. And, you know, when you look at that third sentence, you agree that you will not, nor will you cause or cooperate with others to publicly criticize, ridicule, ridicule disparage, or defame the company or its products, et cetera, et cetera, that that's just sort of a no-brainer. It's almost like, why do you even have to put that in writing? Wouldn't an employee just know that if he goes out and says, God, we got crappy products, that you're probably going to end up losing your job. Well, according to the board, they don't have a problem with the word defame, but they're of the view that, well, what about during a strike? That, you know, they, they, have a, they have a right to criticize the company. They have a right to encourage people to do business with competitors uh, and, and, the, and the like. You know, <clears throat> it's getting a little bit late in the day. The one piece of advice that I would give people here is the, comp the, the board loves the word defame. That's number one. They find that to be okay. And maliciously false, they find okay. So if you use words like don't defame us, don't make maliciously false statements about us, your policy will tend to pass muster. And of course, 99% <clears throat> of the time, people aren't going to end up down at the board. And so you can decide what is or isn't maliciously false. And, and then do the common sense thing. And we get to the ugly, and <clears throat> for those of you who are old-time movie fans such as myself know that is not Eli Wallach. That is the president of the AFL-CIO who had some very interesting comments following last fall's uh, election. He, first of all, said car check is definitely coming back, and for those of you you may remember or have been to a Thompson Colbert seminar of a few years ago. Car check is basically where you get rid of secret ballot elections. The union just signs enough people up to cards and you have to recognize them. He's adamant that this car check is coming back because from his perspective, quote unquote, the president owes us. He was quite clear. Without us, the president loses Ohio, the president loses Wisconsin, the president loses Nevada. He had like one other state that he says he doesn't win it without union support. He owes us. When the, or when the reporter pointed out you're not going to get car checked through a Republican House, he said we're winning the House back in 2014. And he's also very adamant that the future belongs to the unions. 
And the reason that the unions believe that is that they believe that they have a message, they believe certain demographic trends uh, favor them over the long haul. They believe that they have a message that will resonate very strongly with Hispanics. And they believe that they have a real opportunity with, say, the under 30 crowd, just in terms of how people under 30 have been brought up and, and what they think is, is important. <clears throat> I've read social data that goes both ways on that, but it will be somewhat of an interesting, uh, you know, next few years as certainly as the younger 30 crowd, you know, bec starts becoming, you know, a larger and larger portion of our workforce. I know I saw a Gallup poll that <clears throat> unions fared the worst in terms of people having a positive opinion amongst people 65 and older, and they did the best with people 30 and under. And just common sense says you're going to have fewer and fewer 65s and older working for you and more and more 30s and, and, and youngers. Another thing that I think we're going to see is an increase in corporate campaigns. Uh, and corporate campaigns are really designed to do two things. Uh, one is to force employers to be neutral or semi-pro-union in organizing campaigns, or frankly, to put you out of business. Uh, one union, the UFCW, says the next best thing to organizing a grocery store is putting a non-union grocery store out of business. Because if we put them out of business, people will start stop shopping at union uh, uh, stores. An example of a corporate campaign that you may have seen in the news is this 15 or fight at the, uh, like the Jimmy John's and at the McDonald's where employees have been saying you need to raise our wages to $15 an hour and they're walking off the off, off the job um, because what they're trying to do there, one of the methods is it's an appeal to customers. They're hoping that people won't go to McDonald's if there's pickets walking around or if people read and say, okay, I don't think Jimmy John's is doing well by its employees, they'll stop uh, going there. Uh, appeals to shareholders have become quite common. There was a recent study that showed the single biggest source for shareholder initiatives in America the last five years have been union pension plans. And their shareholder initiatives very rarely have anything to do with maximizing shareholder return. It usually has something more to do with you know, our company should agree that unionization is, is just a choice and management should play no role uh, in, in, in that. So, uh, and then legal action. Remember, one of their goals is maybe not to organize you but put you out of business. So the unions have gotten very big into financing wage and hour complaints. Uh, they're very proactive about calling OSHA. Uh, if you're a government contractor, they're very proactive in terms of coordinating with the OFCCP. So, you know, when you're thinking about union avoidance, you need to think about a lot of different uh, areas these days. So, with that, that's my presentation. If there's any questions. Oh.